For guests and visitors, my name is Teresa Russell. I'm the president of the Dublin Worthington Rotary Club. And this is our 24th meeting of the 49th year. And today, our invitation of pledge is being offered by Al Wu. Except Al Wu and Jerry Katz are switching, so. <laughs> okay, then it will be Jerry Katz. From Jerry Katz instead of Al Wu. So in the spirit of reverence, we pray to a divine being and thank you for the opportunity to gather here today as members of the We ask that you bless our meeting and each of us. Guide us in our endeavors to serve our communities and the world. Help us to be mindful of the needs of others and to work together at a positive impact. Let us be the solution to somebody's pain or distress. We pray for those at war. Be with them, seek peace. To this, we all say, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation and power, in this soul. And President elect Jim Farmer, visitors and guests. Well, we got one guest today, a uh, individual by the name of Maggie Lewis. We see her with somebody named Tim. I don't know who this is coming. <laughs> and our other uh, visitor is our speaker today, who will be introduced later, Scott Farmer. Thank you. Any announcements? Make your way. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am making another announcement about the volunteers in the Rotary English Week weekend, <laughs> which will take place the weekend of January 20th. I'll pass out a couple of sign up sheets and I sent out an email with details as well as a link to sign up online. Thank you. As uh, most of you know, I sent around one of my annoying emails about lane sponsorships or a bowling tournament this week, and I'm happy to announce we're up to about $1,300 now. So if you haven't yet gotten a hold of me to tell me you're going to be a lane sponsor, please consult with your spiritual advisors and get a hold of me to thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, a couple quick things uh, for programming. Um, please be aware that... Uh, Joe and I are going to be sending out a letter to the membership uh, to ask anybody and everybody if they have any great ideas for speakers this year. Um, so we solicit your input. That'll be kind of fun. Um, secondly, uh, when I don't know if you if you saw the recent email, but we have a confirmation that the Mongolians are coming late April, early early uh, May. Um, hopefully they'll be here. In a timely way, with the school still in session because there'll be a bunch, a bunch of teachers and wins taking point on any of you that might like to be host. Thank you. Hopefully, all of you will receive the email, but there will be a ways and means of committee meeting in two weeks after this meeting at one o'clock. Um, we'll be discussing both uh, where we've come in terms of our fundraising efforts, along with um, where we're going, to, what we're going to be looking at in the future, including the, uh, what's going to be happening with the, the July 4th event. Um, so everyone is, in, is welcome to attend, anyone welcome to attend, especially those that have uh, Thank you. And our sergeant, our reader slash sergeant today, and here. Apparently, that's easy for you to say. Can I get a volunteer to carry the pot, please? <laughs> Phil, you're there. You want to carry the pot for me? Make yourself useful. Thank you. Okay, so start with our traditional happy dollars. Who has one or two or three? Everybody get your wallets out except our guests. Dick, we'll start with you. 
I have a couple. <laughs> Thank you, know, our, our son David is now at home from the hospital. He had open heart surgery last Thursday. He is doing quite well. He had a murmur for several months, and the doctor said it's time to take care of that. He's he's done. He's home. He's doing well. Good for him. Happy bucks. We had a couple other hands up. Joe. Uh, at this moment, our 17 year old daughter, uh, thank you, Ro, is in the air flying to California to get the plane to Australia in the next three weeks. So, through the, the Worthington Windward uh, walkabout program, so it'll be out there. We have relatives out there for the end, but uh, it's a big adventure for her family over at the police ship, the guys they do it with nothing. Australia, when it's summer there and winter here, yeah, I don't feel sorry for it. Surfing lessons, we'll be okay. What yeah. a great time to go. Yeah. Thank you. I, I know I'm risking uh, violating uh, the third rule of the four way test, but I'm delighted to report that the Michigan Wolverines won the national championship. <laughs> They're big ten. That's all. It's good. Oh, come on. All right. Any more happy dollars? So, I don't know about you, but it's 2024, and I'm so excited. I came down with COVID on December 27th. I was down for two weeks. I'm back, and I am just so looking forward to what this year has in store. Any other happy bucks? All right, four-way test, George, since you brought that up. Who was polling for Michigan the other night? Put your hands up. Guys, that makes you a Vanderbilt fan. Here's why. I got a couple of buddies living in Nashville because the Vanderbilt fans have nothing themselves to cheer for. All they cheer for is the SEC. That's BS. Put, put some money in. You raise your hand. If you're polling for Michigan. It's a, it's a slick way to get rid of him. Get rid of who? Harbaugh. Where's he going? He'll go to the pros. He's done it all. What else could he do in Michigan? I, I think he's going to go when Michigan gets put on probation anyway. <laughs> he, he's going to have to. Uh, George, so I'm back there greeting George. He comes in and tells me, hey, you look nice today, as if to imply that I look like crap on other days. <laughs> It, anybody who didn't pay me that same compliment, put a dollar in. <laughs> on this day in history, this is for everybody. It's, it's going to be three bucks, I'm sure. A famous heavyweight boxer was born on this day. But heavyweight champion. Who wants to take a stab at who it was? Well, you don't know it. Right. That would give it away. I'm, I'm up here to raise money, Tim. That would give it away. Who was it? Buster. Sugar Ray Leonard. I don't think That's a really good guess, but Sugar Ray Leonard weighed about 140 pounds. He wasn't exactly a heavyweight. John Lewis. Is, is that your final guess? Get your money out. It was George Foreman, born 1949. Uh, famous British singer was born on this date in 1945. Who thinks they got it? Nobody? Is that your final answer? Rod Stewart, get your money out. And finally, a famous British singer died on this date seven years ago. It must not have been very famous. You finally got an answer right. I was hoping to get you on that because you thought he might have been born on this date. He was born on the 8th, but he died in the winter. Passed away on this date in 2016. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Reach up and pull the microphone down. Well, today we're going to hear a little bit about Franklin County Children's Services. But I would be remiss uh, before I introduce our speaker if I didn't tell you that he comes to us courtesy of my dearest friend in the world. Many of you know Maggie Lewis. What you may not have known is that Maggie is the senior, <clears throat> excuse me, the senior member of the Franklin County Children's Services Board, Board of Trustees, and she's also the secretary. So Maggie, thank you for introducing us to Scott. Um, Scott Varner is, is with us today, excuse me. And Scott uh, brings 30 years of experience in public service as a community engagement in FLAC, which is to say uh, press communications person. He's the director of communication and community outreach for Franklin County Children's Services. Their mission incidentally is very simple. I think Scott's gonna talk about it. It's protecting children by strengthening families. Scott's a graduate of OU, um, and I believe he had a communications and public affairs uh, role uh, in education there. And previously, he's worked for Columbus City Council, the Columbus City Attorney, the Ohio Department of Transportation, and the Franklin County Board of Commissioners. Immediately pr prior to Franklin County Children's Services, Scott worked for eight years at Columbus City Schools, where he led the district's nationally recognized family engagement efforts, in addition to handling the public and parent outreach for several high-profile challenges. Please join me in welcoming uh, Scott Barnard. Thank you. Thank you. Well, these are tough acts to follow, questions <laughs> and trivia. Um, but, but thank you uh, for this opportunity to, to join the, my friends at the Rotary. Um, I was sharing with some folks earlier that in that role at Columbus City Schools, um, I work closely with our partners at the Columbus Rotary on our um, service above self uh, community service projects with our middle and high school students. And uh, to me, that was always a great opportunity. Those service above self events were, um, oh, I always loved those. They were a great opportunity to connect the Rotarians to young people, to see uh, our students who would go out, they would identify community challenges, uh, they would develop some solutions, they would work with maybe a nonprofit to help raise money or donations. And then you would have these fairs in which the adults would interact with the students, the adults would listen to the teenagers talk about their different projects. and. To me, there's something powerful about when uh, a young person knows that an adult's going to stand there next to them, uh, listen to them, care about what they're saying, and really care about their future. And I guess that that's kind of a, what has been a part of my transition from Columbus City Schools over to uh, Franklin County Children's Services. Um, let me share with you a number since we were about trivia earlier. Um, last year, we had roughly 12,000 investigations um, based upon calls from just a concerned uh, teacher, a concerned nurse, a doctor, a neighbor, somebody who had concerns about child abuse. 12,000 investigations last year alone. And let me tell you, some of those investigations are exactly what you're thinking about. A child who maybe shows up at school with bruises or abrasions on their body, something that's a little far more than just, you know, kind of the scrapes and scratches of growing up. A neighbor who maybe calls in saying that there are young people, young children being left home alone uh, with no supervision, nothing to eat. Or there are the, what I always think, very heartbreaking calls, uh, the ones that you would think about of sexual abuse by a family member. And a child doesn't matter the age, we still get roughly 4,500 calls each year, 4,500 calls each year about sexual abuse for children. I mean, that, that number should be zero, but 4,500 calls each year. But those uh, calls, and there are other calls that we get, the situations you might not think about, 
calls about children in a house where maybe domestic violence between the parents has shattered that sense of safety that every child should have at home, or maybe concerns about a parent who uh, their drug addiction has them passed out or out all night, leaving that child to fend for themselves. And a danger like that grows even greater when there are concerns about drugs in a household and a very young child who may touch, grab, ingest um, those deadly drugs like fentanyl. Substance abuse continues to represent about 14% of the calls that we get. So one in 10 calls has something to do with substance abuse or use. Maybe it's even the 12 year old whose parents are letting them sit at home all day uh, playing video games instead of sending them to school. That's something we might call educational neglect. Then there are the calls from parents that we get who call themselves saying that they are now homeless and don't have any place to care for their child. But here are the really tough ones that maybe you aren't thinking about, that there are some parents who are simply overwhelmed, calling to say that they can simply no longer handle their teenager and they don't know, no longer want custody. Maybe it's because that teen has a mental health challenge that mom and dad doesn't know how to deal with. Uh, maybe the teen has just become so disruptive, so threatening, or worse, become a danger to other children in the home, and the parents simply just don't want them and often call us or call the police. Those are the kinds of examples, all of those different types of calls that lead to about 12,000 investigations by our caseworkers each year. And each time with each call, we're reminded just how, how much family structures have really changed um, over the last several years. The challenges that families face today are far different than what they faced 10 years ago. Heck, even five years ago, when the world changed and we started using terms like pandemic and COVID, then you add in that mental health crisis that's faced by so many of our young people, the stressors of violence, guns in our neighborhoods, um, the uncertainties of our economies. Um, it's a lot. And we recognize that for about the 28,000 children and families in Franklin County who will come into contact with our agency over the course of a normal year, 28,000 kids and their families, we need to think differently about that, what support looks like. Um, and that's what I'm here to, to share a little bit about with you today. Um, and thank you to Maggie for helping get me here today. I really appreciate that. Uh, as you heard, she's been at the table at Children's Services far longer than I have um, and um, always helps remind us that our mission, very simple, as you heard, protecting children by strengthening families, five simple words. Um, and as those examples, I hope showed you that um, protecting and keeping our young people safe these days really does require far, far more than focusing on what we typically think of as child neglect and abuse. So our priority has changed a little bit to be more about protecting what we like to call the whole child, body, mind, and heart, the whole child. So start with a minute thinking about the body. Um, let me share some good news. With all that bad news I was sharing, um, physical abuse, what we call physical abuse that you would normally think of, those calls are actually down over the past five years, down more than 15%. That's good news. Um, now, it still remains the leading reason that we might have to step in, intervene, uh, maybe take custody of a child, find another temporary place for that child to live, perhaps with a perhaps with a family member or a family friend. In fact, we'd actually much rather find uh, those kinship situations, recognizing that the trauma experienced by a young person who comes into the child welfare system, we can significantly reduce that trauma if we're able to place them with a family, uh, a relative, a grandmother, uh, a cousin, an uncle, um, they're not completely removed from that home environment. Last year alone, roughly 40%, so almost half of all the youth where we had to find a temporary place for them to live because of the stressors at home, uh, we were able to put them with kin, a relative, um, or a family friend. But other times that takes the shape of foster care. Uh, when a young person temporarily placed in our uh, safe, encouraging home until they can be hopefully returned to their family, foster care. But let me tell you, the placement of children between the ages of 11 and 17, those tweens and teens um, who come into our care, placing them in a foster care situation has become even more difficult in recent years. 
Um, our friends in the news have shared this story a couple of times um, where the difficulty of placing a tween or a teen has become so difficult that on there are some occasions where they actually, we don't have a place to put them. They stay in our office building overnight. In fact, on several dozens of occasions over the past year, we've had a young person have to spend the night in our office building more than two nights, at least two nights or more. That's why we need more foster care. We want to change that. We need to change that. So we are actively recruiting um, as many as 100 additional foster families specifically to support our tween and teen young people that come into our care. Um, how we're doing that recruiting is hopefully, hopefully changing perception, changing the perception, because the truth is you don't have to be married or middle-aged, you don't have to own your own home or uh, have a graduate degree um, to be a foster parent. Um, while you do need to have a stable income, you don't need to be rich. To be a foster parent, it takes 100% heart to start. Um, so I will ask for your help as you talk to others. Uh, help us recruit more foster parents. Um, if you know someone who would be a great foster parent, um, tell them to search Franklin County Children's Services or search this idea. It's called Take uh, It Takes Heart Ohio. It's our collaboration with the state of Ohio to encourage more foster families. So I talked about the physical abuse a little bit, those ways in which we are when that comes up, we try to get young people out of that situation into a foster home or with kinship. Let me focus a little bit on from body to thinking about the mind. Um, I could probably argue that mental health plays a role in nearly every case that we deal with. Think about it, the mental health of the child or the mental health of the parents, simply experiencing that trauma whenever they are brought into the child welfare system. Just the mere fact that we're involved creates that trauma. Um, but as I think all of you know, Central Ohio is in the midst of a community-wide mental health crisis. And if you're a parent or a young person, you know firsthand how many of our children are struggling with mental health issues. And in fact, they seem to be getting worse or uh, more severe. Our friends at Nationwide Children's Hospital, I've, I've made sure I found this, will tell you that one in five children, one in five children will have a significantly impairing mental disorder not just a mental challenge such as depression, but something significantly impairing, um, but less than half will ever get treatment. So that's why mental health is now part of our screening process. Whenever we get those calls that come in of claims of abuse and neglect, everything from emotional behavior, crisis stabilization, even the role and impacts of social media. Yes, yeah, social media, Facebook and Instagram, when it comes to social media, Think about this, for kids with depression who already feel isolated, um, alone, social media might seem like a gateway to be connected to more folks. But in reality, the risk is that social media can actually increase feelings of depression and loneliness. Um, there's a real fear of, of missing out that they call it that social media FOMO, fear of missing out uh, when they see peers or celebrities who uh, their social success just seems so effortless and easy. Um, it also is a pathway to uh, cyberbullying, to young people uh, hearing things about like maybe suicidal ideation. So it's for all of those reasons that mental health now is part of um, one of the factors that we know so many young people are facing. And unfortunately, um, just as I had that good news about physical abuse going down, the calls that involve mental health challenges are up. In fact, they're way up, like four and a half times more compared to just five years ago. Four and a half times more calls that are related to a young person experiencing mental health challenges. And because of that, we're at Children's Services identifying and investing in new training, new staff, some new strategies to really identify and address some of the trauma and mental health challenges that our young people are facing. Um, if I can, I'm gonna tell you about two, two very quick uh, ones that I think have been successful. First, uh, we've partnered with the National Youth Advocacy Program. They actually have trained mental health workers 24 seven in our uh, intake office. So in our office building, right? So that sometimes young people have to spend the night. So there's at least one person there around the clock to help de-escalate a young person who might come into our building and have kind of a, 
behavioral crisis. Um, they will do uh, pre-mental health assessments, chatting with that young person to make sure that if we are going to place a young person in a foster home, they're going to a place where those parents are ready to address that or at least deal with that um, mental health challenge. Sometimes it's even as simply as that person just talking with a young person or a teen who's suddenly come into our system. Imagine that trauma of being taken from your home and now into one of our uh, buildings. Um, this, these round the clock clinicians are really having an immediate impact on helping us identify and support some of those mental health challenges that kids are facing. The other really good one, and I was sharing that uh, with somebody here who worked for the uh, Village Network, um, was a partnership that we have where they've launched what we call this, um, it's a community reception center. And these are to address those calls I was mentioning where an overwhelmed parent just simply says, I can't do it anymore. Um, and they've called out the police. They've reached that tipping point where that, you know, the, the, the arguments, the fights have become so much. So at this reception center, our partners in law enforcement can bring that team to stay for 24 hours, no longer to the 24 hours because we won't take custody. The parents don't lose custody. But in that 24 hours, it's time enough for us to engage the family, to everyone to cool off for a minute, um, to connect them with community resources, um, to find other community partners who are out there to maybe help through some of the situations that led to that tipping point that we can return that kid home safely. Um, these are just two examples. We know we need more, and we are putting together a very comprehensive plan um, around protecting mental health, around that um, whole child focus uh, with great partners like Children's Hospital, like Adam H, the Family and Children First Council, so many different local organizations. Um, make no mistake, supporting the mental health needs of youth while they await that safe placement while we try to unify them back again with their families, that will continue to be a growing challenge. And um, I know you will hear more about it over the coming year. Um, but before I kind of wrap things up, I really want to take time to focus about heart. So I talked about the whole child, body, mind, and heart. In my time at Columbus City Schools and now my time at Franklin County Children's Services, I've come to learn that our young people in this community, they really are resilient. They made it through COVID, they made it through the challenges, but even the most resilient child benefits from having that one, that one caring adult standing in their corner with them. Right now, every child who comes into our agency is assigned at least one of those caring adults. It might be a caseworker or a mentor or a community partner or a volunteer, someone who serves as that reminder to that young person that they're not alone. So just as we need more foster families, uh, we also need people to join us as mentors, as volunteers. Um, and it just so happens that uh, this month, January, is uh, National Mentoring Month. What a great coincidence. Um, right now, we currently have about 200 mentor volunteers, 200. Um, that's not nearly enough when we think about the five, five to 6,000 young people that may come into our care at some point this year. We have five unique opportunities uh, for mentoring at Children's Services, each with kind of um, a different makeup, different opportunities so that we can best match those who come in and want to volunteer with us, maybe meet uh, the time restrictions that they might have, their availability, um, and their willingness to connect with that child. We actually have two mentoring programs, our Simba and Malika programs that are specifically for um, the black and brown uh, children that come into our care. Um, one for boys, one for girls, matching them with those committed, compassionate adults um, who look like them, share their same cultures, because we know that's important to you. So if you're thinking about wanting to be a mentor with us, maybe you're volunteering, we actually um, have an event next Wednesday. So uh, if you're available next Wednesday night, it's our Make a Difference night. It is uh, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at our Mound Street offices. We're right next to the old Clipper Stadium, if you know where that's at, there by uh, along 70. And during that event, we're really gonna share all of the different ways that um, caring adults can come in and volunteer, mentor, and make a difference in a ch child's life. Because um, we always need more hearts. As I think about um, that protecting the whole child, we also need more hearts to be there with them. 
Um, so that's the point I'm going to end on is celebrating that heart. Um, as I talked to somebody else earlier, you know, our community uh, is filled with organizations um, like this one that are full of hearts and generosity. Um, like I said, you know, I, I learned long ago, you know, that, that service above self idea, uh, whether part of Brody or part of all of the, the things I've done in public service. Um, I'm going to borrow, I think, a phrase I heard earlier, this idea about how do we become uh, the problem solvers who see a world where we can unite, take action, and create lasting change. Uh, and that's really what we need your help to do that as well. Um, I hope those examples kind of show that, you know, our young people here in Franklin County need some of that lasting change and lasting hope. We want every child in Central Ohio to know that there's an entire community ready to stand beside them, to provide them with those supports, that trust to be successful in life, and more importantly, stand ready to protect them, protect them, the whole child, body, mind, and heart. So thank you for this opportunity to talk about the work of Franklin County Children's Services um, and how we too are trying to unite this community to um, take action and protect the whole child, body, mind, and heart. Um, and uh, I hope I've gotten uh, to your heart a few times and maybe you'll be willing to volunteer or become a foster parent. So thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to share more. Thanks. I will take questions. Yes. Yeah. Same question. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we do live in a time when things are changing. One of the things that hopefully is changing for the better is the place to play. And I'm wondering if your interaction with them is changing. Hopefully, right. Well, I think that we, we have a long relationship and partnership with, with our friends in law enforcement, um, in part because when we think about those cases of child abuse and neglect, oftentimes the first, first place we hear about it is through uh, our partners in law enforcement. So um, we've had to work very closely with them. I will tell you, though, that there are... Um, there are situations where uh, we, like the police department, discover that sometimes families don't want to work with us. There's a lot of mistrust in certain parts of our community of government, of police, of children's services. And so part of our job is to really try to overcome that and help families best see the supports that we can provide to families. But the truth of the matter is, uh, for as much support and resources that we can give a family when they come into our care, uh, when a family calls and says, you know, I, I may soon be homeless and not be able to care for my young person. Um, instead of us taking custody, isn't it great that we may have a prevention opportunity to just if we can help them pay their rent, find those ways to give them resources. Because for all the great we do, you do not want to be a part of our system. As a, as a parent, you do not want to come into our system because it can be months of court hearings and visits by a caseworker and other things that, you know, we want parents to focus on being parents, not having to, to work with us, even though the resources, we provide such great resources, but the more that we can keep kids in a in their home with their families, the better. So, hope that. So. Can you talk a little bit about the training to be a foster parent? I'm asking because I know like good, honest, or decent people are your priority, but my son and daughter-in-law are foster parents in the Philadelphia area, and it like took them a year to do the training to get certified, and you know, people like you are saying we need foster parents, and then they're in this bureaucratic mm -hmm. nightmare to become foster parents. Yeah, so... Um... A few years back, Franklin County um, kind of changed the way that we do foster parenting, recruiting of foster parents and licensing of foster parents, and that um, the government agency, us, we don't do it. We actually contract with several other organizations and nonprofits in town to help recruit and do the training and make sure those families get licensed to be a part of our um, part of our opportunities. So I think that has helped with some of that that issue that the bureaucratic red tape. Now you are right. It does take about six months. So from the 
If you if you call today and say, I want to be a foster parent, it would probably be about six months before there would be that opportunity for placement. And it only makes sense. I mean, we want to make sure that there are opportunities to help families kind of, it, it, especially if they've never had a foster child before, if they've never had a child in their home before, making sure all of those, that training is in place, um, some of the home visits that we will do to work with that family, just to make sure everyone is ready. And where you've seen some changes is in some of that behavioral health too, that mental health, making sure that, because we don't know what child may be placed in your home. And we wanna make sure that those parents have every tool uh, know who to call whenever a challenge comes uh, comes their way. So for us, that has been a great opportunity. By working with those outside organizations, they can then tailor that training uh, to best match the families that they're serving and then also be an ongoing resource. So they now know somebody else to call, not just calling us. So hopefully that's how we've tried to make it a lot easier. And I will tell you that we... Like, this is not just a Franklin County issue. This is a statewide issue. And we have really partnered with the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services, the new Ohio Department of Children and Youth, to really focus on this foster care recruitment. So you've probably seen signs about, you know, uh, or maybe billboards about it takes heart. You know, this message that uh, it does take training, does take certification. But the very first thing that it takes, you got to have the heart to do it. Um, because I can look out this crowd, I know all of you will agree that parenting is not easy, whether it's your child or a foster parent. So, thank you. Are you only looking in Franklin County for those volunteers, or are the counties as well? And then I have a second question. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> the, the, this will set. The, I'm only looking for Franklin County because my my title is Franklin County. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're more focused on. But friends, I know that every county can use those volunteers and mentors. There are young people all across our state who could use it, but uh, yes, I'm focused on Franklin County and, and our young people here, very very territorial that way, sorry. <laughs> My second question is, you talked about the 20 to 17 years. Um, I'm imagining some difficult situations with um, stories that I've heard, you know, theft and you know, misbehavior, all that stuff. Can you shed some more current information for a light on that of what's reality versus what we imagine. Yeah, I well, uh, again, as we think about those tween and teen years, um, those are our most difficult placements. And it's for the very reasons you talked about. It's the misperceptions about, gosh, I don't know about raising a, a teenager. Um, I don't know about uh, a 12 year old, even that 13 year old. How do I how do I deal with that? So we're going to go back to, you know, those organizations that we're working with to help us, you know, what additional training, what additional supports. I will tell you as an agency, we actually even step up and we will, um, the financial resources that we provide a family who's taking in a foster child, uh, we increase that amount when it is a tween or a teen, recognizing that uh, not only do teenagers eat more, so your grocery bill is up, but recognize that you may need those additional supports. We now work with families who are in maybe some of those situations on everything from um, helping with college placement as that young person grows older, helping with uh, tutoring, uh, helping with respite. That idea that, gosh, um, being a parent is tough and I just need a break. So is there a possibility that young person can maybe stay somewhere else for a couple of days while I, as, a, as the foster parent, recharge, re, regroup? So, um, we identify that families who are taking in a tween and a teen may need some additional resources. And through those organizations, those great partners, we're trying to make sure that those are available, even if it costs more, because we know it's just so important, especially to be in that family-like setting. And that's the real, the, the real piece here. And um, when we think about that trauma that a young person goes through, we believe that it's lessened whenever they are in a family-like sit situation. Family, like first being somebody that a relative, an, an aunt or an uncle, a grandmother, a grandfather, um, or even a coach or family friend, that's much better. If that doesn't work, then it's foster care. It is at least, you know, but it's in a home, a family like setting. What we don't want to is, and 
while it worked in the past, may not work, you know, these days are those group homes. We still have some group homes, but you don't see the large institutions anymore recognizing that that family-like setting is truly the most beneficial for our young people. One more. How about the uh, mentorship program? What's the demographic of, of the Um, It's going to go back to that heart piece. We really do. We have so many mentors that is that are uh, that run the gamut of of different demographic. It's making sure you have that time available, have that heart available because they, some 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 of these mentoring situations are tough. You know, it is maybe once a week, once every couple of weeks, connecting with that that young person, um, and it can sometimes be taking them out to do something fun. It can be a part of some of our structured programming. It can help them with their, uh, as we get older teens who are maybe looking at college or what it means whenever they age out of the foster care system. Um, so those mentors really step up and it, and it is primarily for our tween and teenage youth that, the, that we first connect mentors with. Um, Though we still have do we have, we have plenty who are also get connected to younger younger children because again the more caring adults that young person has the better off they are well Brent thank you I appreciate the opportunity thank you very much And Scott, thank you again. Do you have links that you can send? And if we want follow-up questions, we can email or... I will yes. definitely do that. Or the easiest thing, if you're a, a Google person, just get on to Google Franklin County Children's Services. Make sure we're the first one that pops up. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. And Charlie, we have a raffle. Dr. Rose, I'm sorry. I can't get the mind this way. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, everybody thinks it's in. Last four, three, zero, zero, six. Oh, thanks. There is 500 and... Oh, five, six, and... In the big five. <laughs> <laughs> Three zero one eight. Go pick out Ace's face. Yeah, you're right. All right, Mona. Well, not. She's going to do grace and air happy travel. That's right. That air. I'm sending out ten ninety nine. Oh, my heart. All right. <laughs> All right, four-way test. <laughs> All right, other things we think, say, or do first. Second. Third. And fourth. All right, thank you. We're adjourned, and don't forget to return your badge to its new spot. Thank you, Charlie, for organizing. I can probably. Hi. Can you re-sign the George and Red letters for the glasses? I, after I didn't realize they actually had names on them. Yes. And Christy just fortunate. This is ridiculous. I saw that. We're not, I can't run all over town. To get a signature. I saw that and I'm like, yeah, we could use it to do it. I, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not like we're signing some legal document. I don't know. Not like we're signing some legal document. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, this is the one because I can't. I'm not sure. So, am I okay with the ethics conference?
And after I sent the one on NIH, it's like lunch one that came right out. Yeah, yeah, I think I might have sent it just to you. Okay. Let me wait. I'm sure. I don't know. I don't know what, so, don't know what we have to go through to get a yes. So you've got. We've got some dry ones. I mean, there's money. I don't know if you can do it without. Yeah. Jerry made some. Uh, I read the email real fast. And, I read it first, and he said something about executive committee needs to decide and then we take a decision. So, on this other one, there's a deadline to be again. Oh, so. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's the next week. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we can only need to be to reset now. I'm sure I can flag it and get on and flag it and shot. No, I bet so that's the thing happening on there. I So I just want to make sure that I'll worry about that. Okay, I had and then of course. Hi, anybody there? I think it's, um... How much does he need? Hey, we pay your dentist for one and a half hour. Where are you going? Dentist for him. Oh, they have a dentist mm -hmm. appointment. Him and Trent. I gotta go pick up 